All right, before we get started on this psalm, there was someone who has a birthday today that was hiding from me and I didn't see was in service with us, but it's also uh, Miss Megan's birthday, who's hiding all the way in the back and not see what you get now for, for trying to hide. Now there's that much more attention brought on you and we are going to sing another happy birthday just for Megan, who is, who is not trying to get the birthday song sung to her, apparently. But um, you, that this is the only way you're going to be able to get that free ice cream. So <laughs> we're going to have to sing a happy birthday to you. And uh, we are very happy to see you here in church with us, especially on your birthday. So let's sing a happy birthday to Megan. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. All right. Two birthdays. Excellent. All right. Now let's. We're gonna dig into this psalm. And this psalm, Psalm ninety-six, is just. Uh, this is a, a really uplifting psalm. This is a very positive psalm. You know, different various psalms are. Some of them are more negative. Some are more positive. And um, I love this. And when I just first started even just listening to this, sometimes I'll listen to the passage before I, I prepare for the sermon. I'm like, this, you know what, this psalm is all about the gospel. Uh, it's a lot, of, a lot of great praising and rejoicing God to God for his salvation and um, about declaring the gospel. And then at the end, it kind of closes with, uh, you know, the, the, this concept of judgment is coming. So, you know, I mean, people need to get saved. People need to hear the gospel. We're going to praise God for his, his gift of salvation and praise the Lord and sing and rejoice because he saves, right? And then, and then ultimately, praise the Lord because he is a God of judgment and judgment is coming. It's, 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 a, it's a time to rejoice and be happy that he does save us. But then also that things will be made right and we're going to actually, there's going to come a time where we're going to be able to live in and know what it's like to live in righteousness with, with Christ here with us and, and, and God being in authority and just everything being um, done the way it, way it ought to be done. So uh, it, it's, it's a very uplifting psalm. And that's just a real high-level overview, but let's dig into these verses now and go through it verse by verse. The Bible says, verse number one, oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. And of course, you know, we, we've, we've seen this phrase before. It's in, it's in a few of the other psalms as well. Singing unto the Lord a new song. Um, you know, with a, with a new birth should come a new song. You know, we, we believe here um, that, that God's ways are, are different than the ways of the world and that we shouldn't be patterning our spirituality at all after the world, right? So the world has its own worship. The world has its own music. The world has its own everything, its own idols, its own uh, um, principalities, its own, its, its, its own uh, uh, morality. All these things that just, just come from the world, but you know what? Those aren't, those aren't of the Father. So the stuff that is of God should be different. That's why we're called to be a peculiar people. We're different. We're supposed to be different from the world. We're, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We're born again. We're born of the Spirit. We're born of God. We're, we're, we're children of God, and therefore, we ought to be different. There ought to be a difference between us and the world, and part of that is with music, with a song. And, and it ought not to just be patterned after and just sound just like the world's song. is just identical to what we would use when we praise the Lord and sing unto the Lord a new song. It's not, I don't think this is just saying like, well, I mean, you just, you just have to learn a new song. Like today, like, it just, like we already have good godly songs. It's not so you just always have to have like, like something brand new, but it's new because it's new to you because it's something, and especially in this context, as we're going to see, we're talking about salvation and we're talking about um, uh, praising God for salvation and for who he is and with that goes a new song. Amen. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. And this is applied to everyone, as we're going to see here. Um, just in general, uh, the God's good news, God's salvation being proclaimed unto all the earth. Look at verse number two. The Bible says, sing unto the Lord. Bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. You know, we ought to be showing God's salvation 
day to day to day to day, just every day continuing going forward, showing the salvation, excuse me, of the Lord. Declare his glory, verse 3, look at this, among the heathen. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. Now, this animates me because there's this, th people have a false idea sometimes when you hyper-focus on Israel and Israel and Israel and Israel. Look, Israel is special. Israel was God's people. There's, there's a lot of special things about the nation of Israel that God chose with the Levites and the Levitical priesthood and, and you know, the, the, the order of Aaron and, and having a nation that God was, was directly involved with and committing the oracles of God unto them and using prophets within that nation to preach, to be this lighthouse for the world. But don't ever forget that they were the lighthouse for the world, right? And, and it's not, it wasn't God choosing this group of people to just be like, well, I just love you and I only care about you and I don't care about anyone else. And it's not like, well, I just love you more than everyone else just because for whatever, you know, for whatever random reason, God's not choosing a race of people and just saying, like, well, you're going to be the superior race because I just love you and I'm just going to pour all my blessings on you. No. The people were chosen, first and foremost, primarily because of Abraham, because of the faith that Abraham was, because Abraham was a friend of God, because Abraham was counted faithful, because Abraham trusted the Lord and he trusted him so much to just be willing to say, God, wherever you have me go, I'm going to go. You lead, I'll follow. Right? So, so the Lord was Abraham's God, truly, wholeheartedly, his God, and said, I'm going to follow you. And God loved that about Abraham. So God chose Abraham and said, okay, well, you know what? Because God already knew the plan anyways. He knew that Christ was going to come. He knew there had to be a Savior. He knew, he knew all this stuff had to happen. He chose Abraham to be that person through which then his family, his descendants, all of that were going to be blessed and God was going to use to bring his word, to bring his son into the world, right? And yeah, so there's, there's a lot there. I'm not saying just to ignore like, like Israel altogether, but we can't get so hyper-focused as to think that like God only cared about Israel. No, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And this is not just some New Testament teaching of God, like, you know, the, the opening up like God did to the Gentiles had a lot more to do with the ministry than it did with the desire to get people saved. And I think people get confused about that, even because you read the passages like, you know, Jesus Christ, well, you know, he, he didn't go out into the other areas, the Samaritans, the other, to the other surrounding nations, and he stayed just within he came unto his own, his own received him not. And part of that's for prophetical reasons, right? And part of that is because he didn't have a very long time in his ministry either. <laughs> so he had a lot of ground to cover in a short amount of time. You know, roughly three and a half years is, is where he was really doing his work, his ministry work. So you can't just travel the whole world in such a short amount of time. He had, you have to keep that confined. He had to keep a focus. He had to, he had to perform all the things necessary to fulfill every scripture that was written about him from the Old Testament. So it wasn't because he didn't care or anything like that. And, and I, I, I'm emphasizing this and focusing on this, and we're going to actually turn to multiple passages because people get this wrong. But even in Psalm 96, hey, declare his glory among the heathen. God has always wanted his word to be known and him to be known among all people, among all nations, which is also why it was part of the law for people to be able to come and join themselves unto Israel. And that's what God wanted. God wanted people, if they became believers, to just go and join themselves unto Israel. And then they could be closer to the altar, to the you know, place where God is going to set his name. And he's like, hey, you know, I'm going to set my name here, and I want you to come to me. Now, of course, not everybody would do that, but you would definitely have believers in other parts of the world. For sure. I mean, you think about even when... when uh, When the children of Israel were, were you know, be before they invaded Jericho, they all knew about the Lord. I mean, they were trembling about the Lord. In, in so many instances, right, Gideon, right, like, like, like people are always knowing and hearing about God. And, and even, you know, I've been studying about, uh, uh, recently my studies have been in, in Ezra. 
and the kings, you know, after their during their captivity, the different kings, the, the Medo-Persian Empire and, and, and the kingdoms that they had, and they're going back, and they're like, oh, yeah, we know that there's, you know, all this stuff going on in Jerusalem with the Jews and their God and, and everything. You know, it's like God's name has been known in, in the Near East and the lands far and wide. And, of course, even through Egypt, right? What nation was there in the world that didn't hear about the Lord when he led the children of Israel out of Egypt? When the, when the Red Sea was parted and all, like, like Pharaoh's armies are decimated. They're destroyed. Their, their chariots, their, their horses were just drowned in the Red Sea as they were chasing Pharaoh. How would you not know about that? How could that not go be blazed abroad and people just tell the news far and wide of what happened? And who could possibly do that? The Lord can. The Lord God of Israel can. And God wants his glory to be made known. He wants people to know. And he's saying even back here, declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. I want you to show forth his salvation from day to day. I want, you know, he wants his name known. He wants salvation known throughout all the world. Not just a New Testament thing. Romans 10, verse 20. Uh, turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 10. You know, Romans 10, of course, we hear, you know, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And you have, you know, how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? And, and you have all those great verses and, and calling on the name of the Lord, right? There's so much great salvation content in Romans chapter 10. But one of the verses I like a lot is, is near the end of Romans 10, verse number 20, where Bible's talking about Isaiah. It says, but Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. And that is the job of the soul winner. You know, they're not asking for us to come to their door, but we're going to go to the door anyways. Amen. Right? Because we're there to do a job. We're there to make God known to all the people. We're there to preach the gospel to every, every creature. Like, like Mark 16, 15 says, and he said, them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's our job. That's what, we, that's what God has always wanted people to do. Missions has been an all-time thing, not just a New Testament thing. Now, this is important, and I think the more that people turn to Judaism, more Christians turn to Judaism for their understanding of the Bible and of the Old Testament, the more warped your understanding is going to be. Because modern-day Judaism comes from the religion of the Pharisees and the Sadducees that rejected Christ. I mean, that's the Talmudic, rabbinic Judaism that persists to this day, that didn't, didn't accept Christ, fully rejected Christ, this is what we see. And, and, but here's the thing, that those people had a, mind, had, a, had a mindset imposed then on their whole nation. So I'm talking about those religious leaders that we'll call the Jews of Judaism had a mentality of being superior to everyone else, to the Gentiles, to anyone else around them that was non-Jewish. And look, that mentality persists today. And not across every single person who is, you know, identifies as a Jew, but, but there is that mentality among many of the, the religious, zealous Jews that are out there that they are better. I mean, you, you, they teach it and believe it. And again, it's not everybody. It's all different variety of, of, of Judaism kind of out there is real liberal stuff and then there's but the people who are the orthodox and, and they're like look they've got a really warped understanding of this and they, they really do think that they're superior to everybody else and it's a it's a total misinterpretation of the Bible all the way around and even Christians kind of fall for this because they just look at Jews as being like oh wow you're a Jew like and they practically want to worship them and it's ridiculous it doesn't make any sense yeah. why why sh why would you be a respecter of persons at all there's no reason to and even the disciples were kind of, had to be corrected on the mindset that they had. Now, clearly in Psalm 96, we see, hey, show forth the salvation day, declare his glory among the heathen. Preach the Lord among the heathen and his wonders among all people. Do we see a restriction here saying, don't go to these nations and preach the Lord to them? Is that anywhere in the Old Testament? Is that anywhere in Scripture? Where God's saying, it's, nope, don't, 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 don't. Nope, they're wicked, don't preach to them. We, just, we don't see that. We don't see the prohibition on the heathens. Now, 
there was prohibition on like the Moabites, uh, um, you know, entering into the congregation of the Lord. But that's not the same as going out and preaching the gospel to the heathen in their land and everything else, right? So there's, there's, a, there's a difference there between becoming a part of the ministry and getting saved and hearing the gospel and everything else. So there's, and you know, I don't want to open that, but it's a kind of a whole another subject, but it's, it's nothing to do with um, what we're looking at here. But in Acts 10, we're, we're going to see this. And, and when you read the book of Acts, it actually, uh, there's multiple instances of this, of this happening where, where you see this, the separation that has gone too far, right? At, at the beginning of the sermon, I was talking about being separated unto the Lord with our music and things like that. We, we separate ourselves, we're peculiar, we're different, but it's not that we now view ourselves as better than everyone else. We're still sinners and we ought to remain humble. We're going to live a more righteous life. We're going to try to live better. But it's, it's not because we just think that, well, we're just better than everyone else. And you got to be, you, you know, you got to understand, hey, but hey, I'm a child of God. Yes, you are. Right? We're going to rule and reign with him as kings and priests and princes. You know, like, like yeah, amen, that's great. But you still don't let that puff you up to where you start thinking that you're better than other, you know, better than other people. Like, no, just, just everyone needs to hear the gospel and you're not going to isolate yourself so much to start thinking like, well, I'm not going to have anything to do with anyone else. They're all wicked. I could do whatever I want to them. But, you know, because we're so much better. And we see that that mindset was kind of instilled in the Jews at the time of Jesus day for sure. And we're going to start reading here in Acts chapter 10, verse 24. And this is, of course, around the same time, right before what we read here is when Peter was fasting and he, and he had the vision of all manner of beasts descending on the earth in a basket, right? And, and he hears the Lord say, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. And of course, he's hungry. He's waiting for dinner to be cooked. And he's in a trance. And, and, and he has this vision and he's like, no, Lord, you know, I, I have, I've never eaten anything that's common or unclean. And then and the Lord answers them in the vision, hey, what God has cleansed, that call not thou common or unclean. And three times that happened, and he's pondering all this stuff. And when that happens, then these messengers uh, arrive where they were told to go to this place, this house, and ask for Simon, whose name was Peter. And, and uh, this story happens, and then, of course, they bring him back where he's going, and this is where we pick up in the story. Look at verse number 24. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, and look at and this is this is important because this is this is telling you, this is this is the proof of what I was saying. Verse 28 says, And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. Now, where does the Bible say that in God's law? It doesn't. It, do, it doesn't say it's unlawful to come unto one of another nation. Why in the world would Psalm 96 be saying, declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people, if, you, if it's against God's law to go and to come unto one of another nation? Or to keep coming, like, no, that's not what it says. But that was their law. That was man's law imposed on them, and it was not God's law. But this, is, this was the mindset and he says, but, but God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And this is where he gets the understanding of that vision that he had saying, ah, oh, that's why God is showing me this to go with them. And now I get it. Now I get it. He didn't want me to know it was unclean. But, no, but look, that, that, that time, no, you misunderstood. They're not common. They're not unclean. You need to go and, and preach the gospel to them. You need to declare his glory like he already said in the Old Testament. <laughs> but now he's opening up Peter's understanding, going like, oh, okay, now I get it, right? And look, we're all, we're all guilty of having 
some misunderstandings about the truth and, and, and having our minds affected from other teachings, other upbringings, other influences out in the world, other traditions, you know, things, they impact us. They, they have to, right? There's, there's, there's no way ultimately around this. We just have to strive to be able to let go of the things that don't make sense, that don't quite add up in Scripture. We need to be able to constantly be able to, to analyze and review what I believe and compare it to the Scripture and make sure it makes sense and adds up. And while we're all susceptible to that, that's why we want to main, try to maintain a pure doctrine as much as possible. Peter gets this revelation, he gets this understanding, and then he's like, all right, cool. And, he's, and you know what? Now he's willing to change. So this has been the law for him, and this is how he's lived his life. But he's like, you know what? God showed me this. Okay, I'm done with that now. Now, now, we're gonna, now I'm going to preach to you. Here I am. Right? I'm going to fellowship with you. I'm going to preach to you. I'm going to preach the word of God to you. Because that, apparently that law was no good, and God, God revealed unto me through his word. There you go. Uh, let's jump down to verse number 34. Verse, uh, yeah, verse 34, the Bible says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Amen. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now look, this is just Peter's revelation. This isn't some change for the New Testament. This is just Peter finally understanding this truth. But Psalm 96 clearly makes it understandable that this has always been the way that it's been with God. And that he's truly not a respecter of persons like the Bible says over and over and over again. Verse 36, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That word I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power and who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. So what's he doing? He's preaching the gospel unto them. He's preaching salvation to these people. He's gone now unto the heathen. He's gone unto the Gentiles who want to know, they want to hear these things. And what does he do? Literally, I mean, this is the gospel. So about Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And hey, we're witnesses of this. He lives. Verse 42, and he commanded us to preach unto the people. And to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. And notice that brings up the judgment there too. And I'm, I'm tying this together here with Acts 10. You'll see as we read, I mean, we've already read through all of Psalm 96, but when we go through it again more thoroughly, you'll see all the references to salvation and an ending in judgment. Because that's the end. I mean, that's what's going to happen in the end too. And that's why people need to be saved is because there is a judgment. And then, of course, he does the same here. And, and notice this, too. Like, he even says, and he commanded us to preach unto the people. And one of the things that you'll notice is the vast majority of the apostles and disciples, they stayed in Israel. They stayed in Jerusalem. They stayed in that area and just kept trying to reach the Jews. But what was the great commission? What did Jesus send? He says, teaching all nations in Matthew 28. Of course, Mark 16, I already quoted that, was go ye into all all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So the commandment was clear from Christ, but they didn't understand it clearly. The commandment is clear to the Calvinist, but they don't really understand it clearly, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's the same type of thing because they'll say, oh, Jesus only died for the saved. No, he died for all men, especially for those that believe. Just like Jesus said, go into all the world not just to the Jews, not just to Israel, right? And then in verse 43, it says, To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Whosoever, anybody. And, that's, and, and look, to him give all the prophets witness. So what does that mean? The Old Testament teaches 
that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. It's consistent. It's what the Bible has always taught. It's not a different form of salvation from Old Testament to New Testament. It's always been the way it is. It's not, we're so much better than everyone else in the world. And God even tells him that in the Old Testament. Like, don't think that I'm choosing you to inherit this land because you're so great. Because you're not that great. You've been rebellious. You've been stiff-necked. I'm not doing it for you. I'm literally just going to take this people out because they're extremely wicked. And I have to bring judgment on them, and I'm going to use you to do it. And I loved Abraham, and I chose him, but you people are not that great. But I'm going to use you anyways. They're not some special people in the sense that they're better than anybody. And nobody is. And nobody is. No one's a special person that's just better than everyone else. No. We're all sinners, and if you're saved, you're saved by grace. It's not based on your work. It's not based on what you do. You can't claim credit or anything for that. We just praise God for it. And then make known his salvation to all the world. And you don't hold back on anybody because you don't like them or because you don't, you know, you think their nation is wicked. You're like, well, you know, that's why they need to hear the gospel too. And you don't have the bad attitude, kind of like Jonah did. Not, well, I don't want to go to Nineveh. I don't want to preach that city. Well, God wanted them to hear it. Uh, turn, if you would, to Isaiah 56. Just one, one more evidence now from the Old Testament that this is an Old Testament teaching just as much as it is a New Testament teaching. That in this sense, nothing has changed. Right? There, we know that there's differences between the Old Testament and New Testament, for sure. And some things were changed in God's law, but, but that all had to do with Levitical priesthood and not just regular moral laws. And nowhere did God ever teach that any one was better than another. So we're, we're, my whole point is here, we're going to see that that teaching is not just something that's changed, because that's clear in the New Testament, but that's always been the way it is. Isaiah 56, verse number one, Old Testament teaching. Thus saith the Lord, keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. And look, same type of context, right? Hey, my salvation is near to come. My righteousness is ready to be revealed. You know, keep judgment, do justice. Blessed is the man that doeth this and the son of man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord. And look, the stranger, who was that? A foreigner. So now he's referring to foreigners that come and join themselves to the Lord, speak, saying, the Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. So don't let, he's saying, don't let that guy that's a foreigner say that God has separated me from his people, that he's different from the rest of his people that are already saved. Hey, I've joined myself in the Lord's people. He shouldn't be saying, oh yeah, I'm, I'm separated from, not, you know, no, you're not separated and then he says, uh, he brings up the eunuch too, or neither let the eunuch say, behold, I'm a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. So he's saying, don't worry about the fact that you're this eunuch, that you're not able to reproduce and stuff like that. He's like, because in my house, you have great honor. In my house, you know, you've got this everlasting name that's not going to be cut off. Don't worry about a physical name here on earth because you've got a much better name in heaven. Also, verse 6, the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people. That's the stranger. That's the foreigner. That's someone who is not a, a native Jew or a Hebrew by birth, by physical, you know, being born into the nation. It's because it's not what it's about. He's saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to accept them just like anybody else. This is Old Testament teaching. This is New Testament teaching. 
nothing has changed. The only thing that changes over time is people's mindset by making uh, traditions of man to be on the same level as the law of God and teaching for doctrine the traditions of men. Let's go back to Psalm 96. And this is important because you got people who are wrong on this on, on all sides. Whenever you start trying to elevate one race above another or one people above another, and I don't care if you're a Jew worshiper or a Jew hater, right? Like if it's a if you if you if you truly are some Nazi or something that that you know it's like, look, man, that's that's not right either, yeah. right? Well, of course we're not going to worship the Jews. We're also not you know we're just going to treat them equal, like anyone else. And look, the religion of Judaism is is horribly wickedly sinful. I mean, that's just it's antichrist, right? And it's going to be called out as such. Absolutely. But we want to save people out of that. So, you know, it is what it is. Psalm 96, verse number 4. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. And, you know, his name needs to be magnified and praised and preached because, you know, other nations have other gods and there are people worshiping. But look, it needs to be understood. He's the God of all nations and he's the God of all gods because these other gods are just idols. They're fake. They're phony. They're not real. And his name needs to be proclaimed as, as such. Verse 6, honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. And all these reasons just to praise God anyways, right? His honor, his majesty, his strength, his beauty. Uh, verse 7, give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. God is deserving of our worship. And, you know, the kindreds of the people are like the families of the people, just in general, right? The families of the earth. Hey, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Everyone ought to be worshiping the Lord. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. And now, you know, all this talk about glorifying the Lord ought to make us stop and just think, hey, how much glory is due unto God's name? First of all, just, just ask yourself a question. How much is due? Because he said, hey, we ought to give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Well, how much is that? How much glory does the, na does the name of the Lord deserve? Can it be measured, <laughs> the amount of glory? I mean, for us, for our perspective, without the Lord, we're nothing because we are nothing. And, and the Lord loves us. He saved us. He died for us. Still blesses us. Is long-suffering and merciful. I mean, like, like how, how much can we magnify the name of the Lord I mean, think about even now, even after being saved, which already deserves an, an immeasurable amount of glory, but we continue day to day and we sin, right? And we know the right way, but we still have this sinful flesh, and yet, and yet God can still find mercy and long-suffering with us, Right? And, and that, how, how thankful ought we be and how much glory should we give to God when we still fail? I mean, obviously, look, we're all, hopefully, are, are, are trying our hardest to, to, to be righteous and do right and not, to, but we still end up slipping and falling and failing. And, and, you know, there's been, I don't know how many times where I'm thinking like, man, you know, I screwed up and you're kind of expecting just maybe the worst, and, and then you get, you get some mercy from God. And thank God for that. And, and I think, you know, I know that God does that when, you, when your heart is contrite and, when, and when, when you truly are repentant and, you, you know, but we don't deserve that. So we start thinking about, well, how much glory is due unto the name of the Lord? It's immeasurable. Well, what do we give unto him? Now, now, now here's, here's the hard part. How much, how much glory do you really give unto God? How would you measure that for yourself? How much glory do I give God? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, there's, there's many ways that you give glory unto the Lord. 
right? Let's think about it. So part of the way you're going to give glory to God is how do I live, right? Am, am I living in a way where I am listening to his voice, respecting his word, and, and, and just trying to live my life in a way that would be respectful and, and obedient to what God said, right? That's, that's one way. Another way, I think a very, a very clear way is how about singing praises to the Lord, Amen. glorifying his name with a sacrifice of praise. Well, how often are you doing that? Right? Is he really getting the glory that he deserves? I think we're all going to fall short on this, but I'm, I'm, I'm making this point. I'm trying to drive it home so that we can have the right heart and the right attitude of thinking every day, look, I, I, like God deserves that glory and that praise all the time. Are you sharing the greatness of God to other people? Right? Are, are you testifying of him and testifying of him? That's a glory and an honor unto the Lord when we talk about him. And say, hey, God's great. You, you know, Jesus Christ did this for you. God loves you. He wants you to be saved. He did, you know, let people know about that. Amen. Warn people about the judgment to come. All of this, all the truth, go out there and, and, and spreading God's word and his truth is going to bring glory to the Lord. Or how about this? When, you, when you're very successful and, and maybe you have people start to, to lift you up. No, it's not me. Hey, God really blessed me. Give the glory unto God. Like when, he, when God saved Hezekiah's life mm -hmm. and granted him more years, but then what happens? The Babylonians come in and he starts bragging on all the stuff that he has. Right. Hey, check out all the stuff I got. That I got, right? Yeah. Instead of giving the glory unto the Lord. Hey, you'll never believe this. I was sick. I was diseased. I was about to die and God gave me 15 more years. He, he granted me life again. He already brought me to this position and gave me all this wealth and has been prospering us and I trusted in him and we had our battles and he won our battles for us. Look, that's giving the glory due unto the Lord's name and not turning it around and, and trying to receive our own glory. And, and I'll tell you what, you know, I, oh, I'll preach hard on this till the day I die that especially with men, but men and women alike ought to be working really hard. And you work and you work and you work your tail off and you need to provide and you need to support, you know. But whatever success you end up getting, you have to then turn around and acknowledge and glorify and praise God for anything that you've gotten. Why? Because God gives you the strength. Because God has given you the knowledge or the wisdom or whatever it is that's helped you to excel and to get to where you're at in your life at all, even in the world. Hey, give God the glory due unto his name. Because without him, you're nothing. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Verse number nine. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. I mean, everyone needs to hear this message too of the judgment and the fear and the fear of the Lord. Right? Obviously, we preach salvation among the heathen. But you can't you can't even teach salvation without being able to demonstrate the fear of the Lord. Amen. Without being able to show that and, and, and preach that truth as well and call out the wickedness of the world so that people know, hey, you're wicked, you're a sinner, and you deserve this punishment from God, and God's a judge, and God will judge. So you need to get saved today. And, you know, uh, on some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the, gar the garment that's spotted by the flesh. We, we, need, we need to be teaching the fear of the Lord to people. Don't ever get so caught up in teaching eternal security at the door with a, with a believer, with, a, with a, some more soul winning to, which of course we absolutely have to spend a lot of time on that. Don't skip over though God's judgment. Amen. Right? We are there to preach the good news, but you cannot skip the, you, the judgment is critical. Amen. You can never leave that out. You, you have to let people know that there is a day of judgment and that judgment is coming and even, you know, Christ is coming back to judge and we don't even know for sure exactly when that day is going to be. 
and you don't know when your last day is going to be, and it's all over the day you breathe your last breath, certainly. Amen. You can't put it off, and judgment will come. And we need to fear before him all the earth. Verse 10, say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. And God is a righteous judge. No one's going to get off uh, uh, because God's some respecter of persons or because he's going to take some bribe. He judges righteously. Amen. He knows all your deeds. He knows everything you've done. And he's going to judge. And you know what? The heathen needs to know that. And I mean, how many times... Do we see this over and over again, the reference to the heathen, to all the earth, to all the world? You know, everyone needs to hear this. This is, this is clear that the Bible is teaching this here. Verse number 11. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord. For he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. And there's that judgment to come. And you know what? All the world, notice, fear before him. We started there in verse number nine and start warning the heathen, hey, God's going to judge righteously. Now, for the heathen, that's a, that ought to be, it's going to be fearful. For the unbeliever, that's a fearful thing to think about. But for those of us who are saved, hey, let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Amen. That's good news when Christ comes back for us. Because when Christ comes back, he's coming to judge the world, but he's coming to save us. Because there's going to be tribulation such as wasn't seen upon the earth against believers, against God's people. And that's when Jesus comes back to save us and then to pour out judgment on the earth. So for everyone who say, hey, this is a glorious day. I mean, this is a, the earth's good. Let the earth sing and heavy. I mean, this is praise God moment when Christ comes back for us believers. Because that is like the epitome of salvation because not only are we going to be having these vile bodies change, we're going to have that resurrection, but he's literally saving us <laughs> from the impending doom of, of all these, these wicked reprobates that are after us trying to kill us. Like, that's awesome. So, that, that of course, that's a glorious day. And just the fact that there's going to be justice and things are righted, you know, that is a reason to, to rejoice and be joyful. Now, a couple other passages I just want to bring up, because obviously we, we went through this whole psalm, but just um, turn, if you would, to, maybe to Isaiah chapter 11. With the remainder of my time, I just, I got, just, just briefly, we're going to look at just some other passages that just talk about the coming judgment, the judgment to come. And how often it's just also tied in with salvation, right? So like real, real popular phrase sometimes, or not phrase, uh, verses, a couple verses in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9 that you might use even out soul winning. Some people use this out soul winning. The Bible says in verse 27, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Right? So there's a reference to, hey, there's judgment to come. Hey, we're all going to die one day, and after that, there's judgment. So you, you need to get saved because Christ died for your sins. Right? And, uh, and, and that will be good news when Christ comes back. So you don't have to worry about being judged of God because he's paid for all your sins. So now you have nothing to worry about, nothing to fear. Right. But what I mean, even just those two verses, just they bring up just judgment. They bring up salvation. Acts 24. This is this is one of the things that popped into my head, too. You're, you're in Isaiah 11. Acts 24, of course, the Apostle Paul, he's bound. Right. He, he's bound up. He's he's be, waiting to be sent to uh, to Caesar. Right. To Rome. And in verse 24, it says, And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned, look at this, of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time when I have a convenient season, I'll call for thee. But, 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 but what does Paul do? Is he holding back from him any truth? No. No. And, but what does he include? Judgment to come. Hey, there, 
hey, Felix, there's judgment coming. So you know, and this is coming from a prisoner. <laughs> the boldness of Paul, in, in no matter what state he was in, to still preach the gospel. He didn't sugarcoat and make it and make it a, 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 a positive only message for Felix so that maybe he'd, he'd think well of him and, and release him from prison. No. He told him the truth. And he, so, he told him the truth so powerfully that, that Felix trembled. He was definitely had the Holy Ghost working with him there because it got to Felix. Unfortunately for Felix, though, he, he, he called, he heard. He didn't answer the call of the Lord. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't respond appropriately when, when given the truth. So, I mean, who knows whatever happened with the rest of his life, but uh, probably, most likely, odds are, didn't go well for him, especially after hearing that and coming so close to probably, you know, tasting of the Word of God and, and then not getting saved is, is a dangerous place to be. Isaiah chapter 11, verse number 1, the Bible says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And of course, this is, we went through this in our Bible study in Isaiah 11, but this is a reference to Jesus Christ's second coming, again. And then the, the you know, the everything being made right, where you have the wolf dwelling with the lamb, and, and, and all of this peace and prosperity. But um, prior to that, it's the judgment, right? And who's bringing the judgment? The branch, Jesus Christ. The, the rod out of the stem of Jesse. Uh, Revelation 19 is the last place I want to look at as far as just the coming judgment. And that's how Psalm 96 closed, and that's how we're closing tonight. I'm going to start reading in verse number 11 of Revelation chapter 19. The Bible says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. Again, this is Jesus Christ that's on this horse. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So there you go. He's talking about Christ, the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Now, would to God that the world can hear this message in fear and understand, hey, Christ is coming, he's going to rule with a rod of iron. Amen. And he's going to stamp out all wickedness. And there is a fierceness and wrath of God Almighty that is going to come down on this earth. Amen. So you better take heed. This isn't a joke. This isn't a fairy tale. This isn't a myth. This is reality, and it's what's going to happen. And you can scoff, and you can laugh at it, but I'll tell you what, this is the truth. Amen. And it's going to happen, and this is your warning. And you know what? Thank God, because you still have time right now. But this wrath is coming, and you want to make sure that you're ready before it comes. You want to be on the right side of this war. You'd rather be the one coming with Christ when he comes and brings the wrath of Almighty God out than on the receiving end of that wrath. Because it'll be too late for you then. 
And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. This is what God does. It doesn't matter how strong they are, how many armies they have, how big their muscles are, how many weapons they have. This is what's going to happen. They're going to be bird food. That's it. Their carcasses are going to be strewn on the ground. Don't put your confidence in man, in any man. You have to put your trust in the Lord. Verse 19, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse which sword proceeded out of his mouth and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. There's judgment to come. It's coming. And, and, and it's not going to tarry when it comes. It's going to come full speed ahead. And, and you know, there, there, is, there is an urgency to salvation. And, and don't ever think that, look, God doesn't just look the other way at sin. Because it all has to be paid for. There is forgiveness but it's only forgiveness because it's been paid by someone else. It's the only reason why you could receive forgiveness. The sin gets paid no matter what. Either you're going to end up paying for your sin or you accept the payment that someone else made for you. But either way, that every sin is paid for by the God of judgment and justice. Every single sin. And we get long suffering and mercy. Why? Because Jesus didn't when he offered up himself and died on the cross and his soul descended into hell. And, and right before his death, cry out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why? So that you won't be forsaken. That's why. But hey, that's good news for us. There's a reason to exalt and glorify the name of God and, and, and give him the glory that's due unto his name. And, and you know, uh, uh, yeah, another thing, how about, how about we don't toss around the name of God? How about we don't throw around Jesus Christ's name as if it's an expletive or even give audience to such things? Let's show some respect and let's, let's, let's give glory unto his name and, and not be entertained by people that want to throw around the name of our Lord and Savior like it's nothing. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this great psalm. What, what an encouraging psalm. What a, what a joyful psalm, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to do exactly as this psalm instructs and to be able to declare your glory among the heathen and to just uh, pronounce salvation and, and, and tell the world of the gospel and, and what you did and how Jesus died for, for every man. Every man needs to hear about this gift that was bought and paid for them because he did die for everyone, so we need to make sure everyone knows about it. It only makes sense, dear Lord. Help us to do that. Strengthen us. Increase our numbers, Lord. Uh, the, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. We need a lot more laborers for this harvest, dear Lord. Bring us more. Uh, help us to start more churches and get people going and preaching the word and, and just getting this gospel message out there for the whole world to hear, dear Lord. I pray that you please embolden us, please strengthen us, please help us to get the sin out of our own lives that we could be used of you that much greater. God, we love you. We thank you for saving us. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.